Um, so our guest this morning is uh, Dr. Kathleen Cavani. And Kathleen is an educator, community builder, researcher, and consultant. And I'd like to share a small bio with you today to give you an idea of the breadth of her interests and, and background and expertise. Dr. Cavani has fulfilled wide-ranging posts as the director of the London Cross Cultural Learner Center. So a hometown girl come back to visit us. Uh, and she's interested in community building consortiums such as vibrant communities. She's been a program consultant in the government of Ontario. She's held a postdoctoral fellowship at the United Nations University in Tokyo and has taught at a number of colleges and universities across the country. She holds a master's in counseling and cross-cultural relations and a doctorate in community building from the University of Toronto. As an assistant professor in business and social services with the Faculty of Agriculture at Dalhousie University in Truro, Kathleen teaches leadership and social action as well as communications and conflict resolution. At that same time, and that, uh, sorry, at that same institution rather, she is also Director of Extended Learning and Director of the Rural Research Center. Her recent research has been on factors that mediate individual and community well-being. She is investigating the science and power of mediation with an intent to replace the notion of self-actualization with more current views on shared actualization. On a more personal note, Kathleen intends to live well beyond 100, so we should <laughs> learn those secrets, I hope, today, uh, and, uh, and is working to be stronger every day. Sadly, she's leaving town this evening, if anybody had intentions of indulging her love of dining out. We had that pleasure last night. Unfortunately, uh, those who didn't participate have lost that opportunity this time around. We can only hope um, to be a future recipient of her equal love of hosting dinners and extending spiritual hospitality, particularly with the, quote, succulent tastes of live foods. I love that line that she provided to us. We're in, we've invited her today because she is equally adept at serving food for thought and inspiration. So without further ado, please help me welcome Dr. Kathleen Cavani. Good day. Like you, I am in love with life. The planet, the people, and well, most of the critters that live here. I, like you, also ha have an abundance of ideas and energy. And I look forward to sharing ideas with you in this valuable time we have together. Because I know I need you, your ideas, and energy to help forge the dreams I dream of. So today, I encourage all of us, I urge us to dream big dreams. The London Community Foundation inspires me, and the work you do inspires many more than you know. The London Community Foundation has been, as we've been hearing today, could be likened to one of those finest dating sites. It matches people up, innovation with needs for healthier and happier union. Folks who were otherwise isolated or not connected and are now forging new relationships. And most playfully, it offers ideas of things you should be doing to get noticed and achieve lasting results, and maybe lasting friendships. So today we are urged to talk together about pressing issues of our time and to engage through questions that matter, provoke, and inspire. I'm sorry, I'm, folks there, we could actually move you. You don't need to stay there because we have lots of room in the, lots of space in the room. But in the spirit of integrity and transparency, I'd like to first talk with you about how, how I didn't have a good grip on life. I have had to change my thinking 
and to learn to focus on what was most important for personal and collective happiness, health, and love. We'll have little talk of sex around here, though. We are Canadians, after all, and we'll leave that to the real dating sites. This is a time for you, as community leaders, to come together with me on a mental, emotional, and spiritual journey. I will describe some important notions like Ubuntu, stewardship, dreaming, and well-being. I happen to know a lot about these ideas. I have not been a fast learner. It was only when I did my doctorate that I came to realize three important insights. I don't know what I don't know. What I do know is so little of what there is to know. And I'm okay with that because you know things I don't know and you know things I don't know. And collectively, we know it all. And thirdly, I cannot not know what I know. But these realizations sparked more critical reflection in my life. I came to acknowledge that I could not abide anything that oppresses women and disempowers people. That stopped me in my tracks. I had to examine where oppression and disempowerment resided in my life. That was a profound, humbling awakening to truly look at and see where I was interacting in the world in less functional ways. So now, I often focus on where good things are happening to transform disempowerment and oppressiveness into justice, collaboration, joyful responsibility, and liberation. So some cool things we can do to up our game in happiness, health, and love are depicted in this infographic. Research shows many practical things we can readily do to be happier and healthier and more productive and ready to serve others. Smile. Studies show that smiling about something positive that makes you smile can actually make you happier. And smiling can spark positive memories and good enzymes. Engage in physical activity as it, ex it excites the brain to release endorphins and to feel the good chemical to improve well-being. Pray, laugh, love. Go for a stroll in the park. Perform an act of kindness. People here would know the value of doing good for society and the benefits to the individual too are well documented. And like volunteering, helping others has been found to boost happiness, ease depression, and help you live longer. And as Tony said, that's my plan, and I'd like you all to be with me on that 100 years plus. Listen to happy music. Walk tall. This is a cool idea. Walking tall with an upbeat stride might make you feel happier. Florida researchers told walkers to take long strides with their arms swinging and their heads held high. These tall walkers reported feeling happier after a little jaunt than a group that was informed to shuffle and look downwards. Okay, so maybe it was a little bit of the Florida sunshine too that helped. Take up practices of daily meditation. Give thanks. Keep a gratitude journal. You may see many different ideas for yourself that you already employ in your life. Have sex, or take a nap, have a cup of tea. All of them have been found to bolster well-being. But if from all these ideas your take-home message is to show your partner the science that supports having more sex, then you're not paying attention. My key message is to cultivate our sense of efficacy and responsibility for co-creating the best lives and communities we can. I have a book under development entitled Joyful Responsibility, or a new title I like better, Spot the Joy. My friend Dr. Robert Zuber, who works at the UN in war prevention, a bit of heavy work that dude does, he says his colleagues could do well with getting that book because people who work there are heavily burdened and they could do with living more joyfully. 
Years ago, Kofi Annan was asked, how many people work at the UN? He paused and said, hmm, about half. <laughs> Mark Twain shared an observation. I had a terrible life, but fortunately, most of it didn't happen. The opposite also is true for many of us. We have blessed lives. We have more blessings than we can count, but too often we neglect to see them or seize them. Could I ask one of you, the extraordinary leaders of London Middlesex, to stand and read out this quote in a compelling voice, like you were auditioning for a spot on Oprah? Until the mind can love and admire and trust and hope and endure, reasoned principles of moral conduct are seeds cast upon the highway of life, which the unconscious passenger tramples into dust, although they would bear the harvest of his or her happiness. Thank you, Jacqueline. Before you sit, I want to offer you a little token of um, extraordinary courage to come up and do this uh, reading. And also, as a reminder of the gems in life, I want to read out the words too for the group, but also to underscore our interconnectedness. The Celtic tree of life is a symbol of balance and harmony. Its branches and roots form a map of the cosmos, wherein all things are interwoven and connected. Please, if we could have a round of applause, please, for Jacqueline. Thank you. That's the gift of courage. So people who have a practice of mindfulness, contemplation, or prayerfulness are finding that it inspires attentiveness and living in the present. And what a gift we give ourselves when we do that. Is there anywhere else to live but the present moment, I ask you? This is all there is. If we had more time, I would share some exciting findings on the science and the art of mindfulness and take you through a mindful exercise. But that is another area of my life that I have significantly changed, thanks to my very principled and inspiring friend, Irene. I interact very differently with religious systems. I now choose to recognize the divine in each of us, and I encourage mindful practices as some of the best ways to tap into the endless creativity and powers each of us possess. And when we leverage those with other people's powers, twin powers activate, as we know. So the big answers to the big questions about health and happiness are complicated. While inequality is the most significant factor contributing to ill health, and clearly inequality needs to be addressed as our friends around the room have been uh, stating this morning, it is helpful to recognize that not all the answers are out there. As many answers as possible need to be nurtured and harnessed from within. And from this place of power, we can draw to us many more who share our vision and who want to invest in our big dream. One of my dreams is to see Ubuntu communities living out our joyful responsibility. It would be like activating all towns and cities to be the smart and caring communities they are capable of being, as the Canadian foundations are promoting. For my doctoral work, I investigated the idea of stewardship and how do people come to invest or steward their time treasure, talent, or our collective trees for the greater good. How do we do that? How do we get guided and how, what is it that we use to decide where we invest ourselves? And I'm very interested in, in, in observing and in interpreting what kind of world are we creating with the thinking and acting we are engaging in today. So in these troubling times, healthier pathways become essential. Many would argue that we need to change the game of consumerism and capitalism. 
this, this, these systems of uh, often unquestioned regimes, many argue, need dramatic deconstruction. The coming age is to be seen as the age of stewardship. We are here not to govern and exploit, but to maintain and creatively transform and carry on the torch of evolution. Love that stuff. All humankind, all life, in fact, is interconnected. What we choose to think, feel, and do does matter. To ensure a sustainable quality of life for all, each individual must choose to courageously steward his or her resources. You contribute to making the future by the decisions and actions you take today. One important contribution I am working on, as Tony said in the intro, is on updating Maslow's hierarchy of needs. Actualization is not a solo act. Clearly, humans evolve and actualize with one another's help. I need you. I can't be who I need to be until you become who you need to be. We are intricately interwoven, beautifully so. We share in one another's actualization and collectively develop the conditions in which peak experiences can arise. Of course, individuals do the work, aspire and claim their summit, most recent in the beautiful Olympian uh, accomplishments, both in the Special Olympics and the Olympics where we see people uh, challenging themselves to the height. But behind these champions are an array of talented and dedicated supporters, contributors, and agents for change. My research is showing that we are driven by shared actualization and Ubuntu principles. Ubuntu is a South African expression. That means a person is a person through other persons. How beautiful a people, a culture, and a language to have such a concept embedded into the vocabulary and thought processes. We don't have a similar concept in English, Ubuntu. Language is one of those tools that inform our thinking and our beliefs of what is possible. We need language for engaging beyond current realities and possibilities. These vexing times call for action. These vexing times call for changing ideas and creativity. These vexing times call for new collaborations. We need you and your interconnected solutions and solutions. A huge reality check for me was being unhealthy. For many of my young adult years, well, not to get too personal here, but when I had candida, candida for years, if not a decade, I had no idea how good it could feel to be clean in my body, my mind, and to feel alert and in control of my life. I was anxious, hyper, unable to think clearly. I was impatient and jumpy. My body was overrun with bad bacteria. I was not in control. And I was not able to be the change agent I was striving to be. Just ask my wonderful former husband, Bill. With help of a naturopath, I came to see. My food was poisoning me. As a result of this shocking reality check, I shifted my interaction with the food system and with a lot of environmental considerations. I have come to know so much more about food and place and environment and people and how we interact together and how powerful we can be by the choices we make. The idea of cultivating gardens and growing ourselves and increasing greater security of food clearly is not a new idea. In some ways, it's reclaiming in new ways. So I have pursued what is equivalent to about a master's degree in the art and science of eating live, fresh, raw foods. I have come to recognize the power I have in my own body also. Do you know, according to the Journal of Nonprofit Management, that one of the largest reasons for most people over the age of 55 for not regularly volunteering or engaging in the community is that they are not fit enough or healthy enough to keep at it. 55! This is crazy! 
What kind of society are we creating if we are calling for active engagement while at the same time our engagement in the large food systems, the industrial systems, the social systems of inequality and injustice, these are zapping our energy and vitality. We're working against ourselves. I am not here to articulate the details of healthy living. That's another topic altogether. But I am here to advocate for you as community leaders to claim your own best happiness, health, and power. This is a critical issue in order for you to show up with your best self to do your best work with your best collaborators. Without your clarity of mind, your strength of body, and your deep source of energy, the good work we need to do together, the dreams we're dreaming will not come to fruition. For me, paying attention to my health and vitality has helped turn my life around. Such substantial improvements have happened also to many others, largely by paying attention to improvements we can make in how and what and with whom we eat. So for our food is our medicine. And more cultivation and support of local food may be the most helpful on our path for resiliency and sustainability. And through the practices of planning, preparing and enjoying our meals, we are empowering ourselves and owning our portion of responsibility for our health and well-being. I'm not saying that there are not these other factors in determining health. Clearly, we know of the 12 determinants of health, and they've been well-researched and documented. We know many systems need to be overhauled if our societies genuinely want equality and engagement for all. How seriously do we want to do this work? How committed are we to equality? How ready are we to examine ourselves? So at my top weight, I was 20 pounds heavier than I am now. I may be tall and lean, but uh, this body is tough and mean. I was thinking of demonstrating 50 push-ups, but then I thought, that might be emphasizing my state of health, and that would miss the point. And I do have a point. This is not about my journey alone. It is about our journey of being vital to boldly and effectively care for each other, to be able to carry our brothers' and sisters' burdens for a while on our shoulders. And you know, we all have broad and capable shoulders. One of my key philosophies is, not for ourselves, but for the whole world were we born. Hey, Mary, that's what we're here for. Now that I know what I know about being well in the body and spirit and mind, and about the shocking levels of inactivity in our communities due to poor health, I actively maintain high standards of health and fitness. I want to do all I can to be well recognizing I lead a very privileged life. I am hopeful of not demanding too much of the healthcare system and to enable myself to be the agent of change that my life is about. I believe I have a responsibility to do so, a joyful responsibility. My point is our physical and personal fitness is a decision that has far rippling effect. So, I want to walk the talk. And I'm wondering, and I want to ask you, rather cautiously, should I give you 10 straight arm push-ups? And I'm cautious for four reasons. This is a professional presentation, and that is not done. I broke my wrist seven months ago, and it's not yet fully mended. I have two fine young men, international students, sharing my home, and they were hesitant. And when I probed a little and asked them why, mostly they were concerned that this may not be a suitable thing to do for a woman, and in a dress. So I reflected, as any good person would do, on the logic behind these reasons. And I had to ask myself, are these sound reasons? 
Are they sufficient for game changers? This is one small example of owning our strength. After all, we are game changers. We are changing the rules and changing the game. So, shall I demonstrate? Go out there and play like a girl. <laughs> so no part of our lives is left untouched by our food choices. What we habitually choose to eat has wide-ranging physical, spiritual, political, environmental, economic, social, emotional, and mental implications. Did I miss anything? Mary Ann could let me know if I did. And when we influence the food choices of others, as many of us do, we compound that impact. Imagine the minds were aiding or hindering by the food choices that we're often providing. We could give a push-up break for everybody, if you like. So while it is another topic to cover how choices for food link to these areas, the take home message from this part on this piece of health and fitness is that we have responsibility to be well, to be our best selves, and to support each other in that journey. And this brings me to the third theme of love, fostering health, happiness, and love. Three of the most important personal and collective roles. What more important work is there? Love is a topic we all know well. You probably know it much better than I do, as you are all leaders and agents of civil society and the greater good. As for me, I told you, I know so little of what there is to know. And I have loads to learn about love. But I do want to share some inspiring ideas that I have come across in my research on how significant love is as a driving force. It has momentum, it has purpose, and it brings gifts. Stewardship engages us in practices and conversations that include qualities like love and compassion, not just as abstract virtues that are properties of saints and do-gooders, People can develop virtuous qualities in themselves just by doing the spiritual practice. You develop through the practice. And by freely doing these practices, human development can and does occur. And I am very much interested in this piece. This is my area of work of forming the best human development conditions we can for all. We need to do that co-creation of space in a healthy way together. So our work in diverse ways, in diverse settings, rural and urban, it's about cultivating strategies for greater justice, compassion, well-being, understanding, prosperity, and love. As Paul Graham described in the 2008 article, Cities and Ambition, cities strive for and radiate certain messages and, and practices. So far, the complete list of messages I've picked up on from in cities is wealth, style, hipness, physical attractiveness, fame, political power, economic power, intelligence, social class, and quality of life. Why should we care about the messages cities send? Graham goes on. My immediate reaction to this list is that it makes me slightly queasy. I had always considered ambition a good thing, but I realize now that was because I implicitly understood it to mean ambition in the areas I cared about. When we list everything ambitious people are ambitious about, it's not so pretty. 
It just takes a few brazen, principled, bold thinkers to step out and say, hey, the game doesn't have to be played this way. Brazen folks. Okay, you won't get invited to too many parties. But you get things done. And you raise the bar. Vygotsky, a Russian psychologist and educator, referred to this as expanding the zone of proximal development, your ZBD. We need key role models, people whose lives epitomize good things. Like in Mecca, 3,000 years ago, stated, act justly, love tenderly, walk humbly with the planet and life on Earth. They epitomize also the famous Zen proverb, before enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. After enlightenment, chop wood, carry water. They do some of the same things everyone must do, but they do so with a zest and a spirit that arouses the best in others. Through their tenacious nudging, along with their personal invitations, they succeed in inspiring people to assume their roles as citizens and as agents of change. No one is exempt of citizenship. We all have rights and obligations. When we choose to act consciously, guided by love, we liberate more energy to improve life on Earth. By becoming more alert and awake, we see that every decision we make amplifies or impedes human and environmental well-being. It's our choice. What we do and what we think matters. So if I could ask one of the, another fine leader in the room to be courageous to stand up and to read this quote out, please, with a nice, vibrant voice. There's chocolate in it for you. <clears throat> what one really needs is not Nobel laureates, but love. How do you think one gets to be a Nobel laureate? Wanting love, that's how. What is so bad one works all the time and end up a Nobel laureate. It's a consolation prize. What matters is love. Thank you, Valley. <laughs> what matters is love. A Nobel laureate, a biologist who works so hard, and boy, can I identify with working too much. And his passions for helping us understand new insights that we needed and yet underlying it was driven by love. Why do people interact in the community? From my research and the work of many of you in the field of philanthropy and volunteering, the number one reason for getting involved is that people were asked by someone they like and respect. Someone saw their gifts and asked them to share parts of themselves whether it be their time, treasure, talent, or collective trees. People do want more opportunities and encouragement to be active in the democratic process and in bettering humanity and the planet. The London Community Foundation has invested in many inspiring and impactful community innovations. Last year, the three funded under the Community Vitality Grants program we heard of earlier, Extreme Clean, helping people uh, establish and enjoy a greater sense of pride in their clean places, uh, communities career connect, youth employed in meaningful ways like home building, and poverty research, poverty uh, reduction, planning, looking at systems, getting into uproot, what are the obstacles to inclusion of our brothers and sisters, fully integrated into our communities. And the inspiring stories continue. So I do urge you to look at the London Community Foundation website. They might just be the story that sparks ways that you can collaborate even more effectively and bring forward your bold, new, and transformative strategies. In his 2000, or his 1903 quote that I read in 2003, 100 years later, Samuel Butler wrote, if people would dare to speak to one another unreservedly there would be a good deal less sorrow in the world a hundred years hence. So we're at 2014. What's going to be like in 2114? 
What conditions are we fostering? What kind of future are we creating? What legacy are we building? So let's talk unreservedly. Let's talk about what we need to do to see less sorrow. What are we talking about in our conversations? What questions are we asking ourselves and each other? Let's talk about and bring to fruition the shifts in consciousness and in our systems needed to ignite more well-being and inclusion for all. What are the substantial changes and the compelling arguments that Tony was talking about earlier that we need to bring well-being and inclusion foremost and our outcomes of whatever description we would have for them? What systems changes are we bringing? What approaches are we using to prevent and mitigate problems and formulate exciting and effective sustainable transformative solutions. So on your tables are blue cards. I'm going to invite you to think about your key burning questions. What are you or your organizations on fire about? Think in terms of questions. Now questions, formulating a question, it activates the twin powers of the right and left hemisphere. So questions turn on more engines than answers do. And questions are so much more interesting. So take a minute or two to formulate your own questions in silence and write them down on the card. You write down your brilliant burning blue questions. A couple examples I can give you. What are the creative ways that community isolation and loneliness have been turned on their head in other communities? Why does this question excite me? And what am I ready to do about it? Or another question might be, what are the various factors that we can address to lower cancer levels in Middlesex? So after writing your questions, not your answers, but your questions, then I ask you to please pair and share with a person near you, and you can exchange your blue cards and the energy behind those questions. And I'll call you back in uh, seven minutes when we've had some time to get into those burning, brilliant, energizing questions. Is the task clear? Please go to it. Burning questions, please. Blue questions. Blue sky questions. Thank you for engaging so richly and deeply and uh, some interesting conversations I was able to eavesdrop in and be part of. Clearly we live in a complicated, complex world with issues that are convoluted, wicked and intractable at times. Wicked problems need wicked solutions and sometimes it's solutions that need energy and effort to develop. I was going to say chocolate is needed. <laughs> uh, does someone else need chocolate? Could I enlist another uh, volunteer to read out this quote with power? Please. A uh, mic is coming from Lori. No one's doing this chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> We're not questioning your motives. You don't need to confess to us. If the obligation to fix society were placed solely on religious and spiritual thinkers, or business management, or labor unions, or governments, or social justice advocates, or the artistic community, or the women's movement, or ecologists, or technologists, not one of these gr groups by itself would have the knowledge or the wisdom to resolve the crises that societies have created. Thank you. Please. Come get chocolate. Chocolate is a reward in itself, for sure. Thank you, Kathy. <laughs> Thank you. We need game-changing ideas and collaborative, creative approaches. But fortunately, we have you, and you, and you, and the connections still to be um, developed and unfolding. Tenacious problems, you have met your match. Meet the game changers of London and Middlesex. 
So this fourth launch of the Community Vitalities Grant Program is the most exciting game changer opportunity. You heard this morning that you have the opportunity for impact and for leveraging your work more than ever before. With the London Community Foundation doubling the funds to a million dollars, this opens up so many prospects for investing in your audacious dreams and bringing to fruition those initiatives that have been burning in your hearts and minds. We are excited to be calling for and celebrating collective impact. What is it? Well, I have a treasure chest of inspiring examples of collective impact to share. And you can also find many, many more on the Foundation website as well as many other locations. But I'm going to choose just a couple, a Canadian example and an American, to bring you through some of the uh, details of uh, pursuing in earnest some transformative projects. So these examples are just to show how they consider many of the elements for structural and substantial change. They are not intended as prescriptive, but just as uh, an opportunity for us to extract lessons from the scaffolding or the architecture that they use for their success. So vibrant communities, this is one I know well as I've had the privilege and the pleasure to work with Paul Bourne for a year on this pan-Canadian poverty reduction initiative. And through formulating a common agenda, vibrant communities were able to ignite public imagination and community engagement to create and grow a movement of diverse leaders and communities committed to unleashing the potential of communities to substantially reduce poverty and ensure a quality of life for all citizens. Their approach includes developing mutually reinforcing activities, solutions to a complex problem need a, a set of interlinked interventions. So they have 13 linked up regional collective initiatives, each with a locally designed strategy and all with shared leadership by representatives of all sectors. People who represent poverty and have experience of poverty, uh, heads of corporation, funders, academics, game changers, all come to the same table. Everyone is part of the solution. No one comes to the table to blame. Community leaders from these local networks also participate in the pan-Canadian learning communities to share experiences from funders, policymakers, and civil society. And the impact? And how do they know? They have shared measurement established across the country. Each area has local evaluation plans, but also standardized outcomes. And they use tracking templates to capture what is going on in communities and in households. They are looking for changes in individual and household well-being, in community capacity building, in community innovation, as well they're looking for systems and policy change. They're also looking at relationships that have been developed. And since 2002, Vibrant Communities has helped 203,000 Canadians be better off. They've increased their income. These people have helped increase access to their food. They have better shelter. Their transportation needs have been addressed in some cases. And levels of skill and personal efficacy have grown tremendously. Vibrant Communities also has such a good working relation with funders across the country and in local areas that together they have orchestrated needed shifts in the way poverty reduction initiatives are funded. The national network is now about 4,000 representatives from business, government, voices of experience, and from nonprofits. They have mobilized 23 million for poverty reduction efforts and educational events. Another feature of their success can be viewed through the lens of continuous communications. For any of you who are on Paul Bourne's uh, mailing list, you will know that they are expert at staying in touch and keeping you informed and excited about upcoming learning events. These regular communications also help network members uh, refine strategies and challenge each other and share successes and obstacles. And the final feature to emphasize in this architecture is a central system of support. And that's through TAMRAC, the Institute for Community Engagement. There is a system of local leaders who support the efforts to keep ensuring progress is rolling along. 
So the linked up collaboration, this one may be on a different scale than yours, but I believe there are valuable lessons to be extracted by looking at the lenses for successful collaboration and to see how impactful they've been. So a, a second example I'll bring you through is the uh, collective impact from Opportunity Chicago. In 2006, Chicago residents recognized that disjointed interventions weren't working. In public housing, there were still tremendous issues and uh, lives were not being transformed. They realized that the Chicago Housing Authority, the Human Service Organization, and workforce agencies could not work separately if they were going to have the impact of helping people become economically self-sufficient. So a collaborative network was developed and the game needed to change. A new partnership was formed to improve employment services for people in the area. And they built on what was there. But they added flexible resources and a platform for integrating into already existing services. The partners convened an independent strategic advisory group with key leaders and change agents from all sectors. They provided expertise and knowledge of best practices and offered guidance and advocacy for needed policy changes. They also formed working groups, which is a neat idea, to address the issues of particular concern like in employment and workforce development. They had impact. Their goal was to place 5,000 residents in unsubsidized employment in five years. And by the end of 2010, they had placed 5,696, 14% over their projection. 77% worked after the program and 50% uh, retained jobs after two years and 50% also saw an increase in their wages. So the features that we can look at through Opportunity Chicago similarly can extract lessons for our own application. Opportunity Chicago noted that having the right people who built a high regard for each other and who could influence one another is really a hallmark of their effort of success. So their common agenda, they all work together towards this efficient model of supporting people towards self-sufficiency. They had shared measurement. They had big picture metrics, such as housing and employment status were tracked along with metrics for participation and training programs, types of employment and retention. And as Tony said earlier, some of this is sometimes difficult to get our hands on. What are some of the changes we're making in capturing quantitative and qualitative shifts are really important in the work that we do. Data were collected and analyzed and shared also among partners and used to improve services and to coordinate further activities. So data sharing, having credible data sets is really important to ensure both funders, other collaborators and participants are really feeling it's a genuine um, and meaningful exercise, of course. So mutually reinforcing activities is the other piece of the puzzle. And it, it was necessary in Sh Opportunity Chicago that they had space to meet together. And they had their nine working groups working together around a strategic focus. And this layer structure gave them um, a broad sense of a decentralized model. My uh, consulting company is called the, De in uh, the Decentralized Intelligence Agency. I always thought it was audacious of the governments to suggest that they could centralize intelligence. Clearly, it's in all of us, and it's necessary for us to be able to link that up effectively through um, tools and, and really smart tools. I'm hearing such wisdom in the room here today, such great questions asked this morning, and such good energy around those questions that you're burning to address. Um, we're in good hands. At last night at dinner, too, we were saying how I'm not being discouraged because young people, too, have such brilliant things to contribute. They have ideas and ways that we're going to see ourselves resolve our challenges, but we mustn't delay in caring for the people who are marginalized currently. I digress. But it's all good about this topic of continuous communication as well. Is that where we're at? Yeah. Uh, different forms of communication were used for different purposes, of course, in Opportunity Chicago. Uh, they had working groups that were meeting regularly to monitor very specific outcomes and they were revising strategies as they go. That's an important thing to put into proposal thinking is our calibrating 
knowing what we know. We can't not know what we know. And when we find new information and new strategies, we have to update and upgrade. So the central organization that facilitated the communications, um, they were able to share um, data and it really enabled um, successes, particularly because key findings were also promoted through media and um, the media was a big collaborator as was a social presence. And the last uh, piece of the uh, scaffolding is the program support. The whole initiative was supported by a nonprofit that had tremendous credibility, that it was viewed as a neutral agent, and they were in their neutrality and credibility able to uh, really uh, bring in together a number of other key players. And as we heard in the quote at the beginning about Opportunity Chicago, having those uh, key actors in the, in the effort was really essential to get the results we're talking about. We are not talking small change here. We are talking change in the game. So this is, a, I think, another sub, um, superb example of thinking about how systems fit together, how strategic thinking needs to be brought to bear. And these are ways that um, we can kind of extract the lessons for our own applications. In 2011, an address by the Canadian Foundations of Canada Conference in our, our Smart Communities and Caring Communities, the Governor General of Canada, His Excellency, uh, the Right Honourable David Johnson, he sparked the idea of a national initiative to support and foster caring and smart communities. And he reminded us in that talk in 2011 that it took uh, the printing press in Western Europe one of the great communication uh, revolutions, almost three centuries to reach a majority of the population. The internet now, the latest tool that we have, it has taken less than a decade to reach over half the globe. Imagine what we can do together. This is just one example of a tool. It's not the only one, of course, of what we can do with our talents when we tap into those and really bring um, innovation by using the tools we have more effectively. So when His Excellency was the president of the University of Waterloo, he was very engaged with the formation of the Canadian Index of Well-Being. This tool helps to measure interrelated factors affecting well-being for Canadians and Canadian communities. And the indicators help to capture what we would be proud of in our high-functioning, democratic, creative, caring and intelligent, healthy and vibrant, inclusive and just, compassionate, sustainable and prosperous, playful and loving communities. This is the stuff that I'm on fire about. So the London Community Foundation has the priority areas that we've heard about this morning, ensuring that we're thinking in new ways, creating true collaborations, getting at what differences we're making, really getting good at that, and leveraging resources. So this all adds up to changing the game, changing our thinking, and changing the results. This is a symbol of change by game changers. This is game changers blue. We are changing the way we are seeing things and transforming what we used to have. We don't approach things the same way anymore. We don't see problems as hurdles, but as opportunities to expand our thinking and leverage our resources. We are smart and caring members of smart and caring neighborhoods and of organizations and of communities and of families. Our solutions are not out there for someone else to invent. We are the inventors. You are the game changers. We know that there is much we can tap into to cultivate community efficacy. We can't delay. The pernicious problems call out for help. They are seeking bold leaders ready to see and to take action. Something's got to change. The research is quite compelling. As you know, I have been working in the field of, for decades and in order to keep current with my class at the university and be leading edge. I was recently searching for uh, materials and found that um, f successfully uh, s facilitating sustainable change is some really good material about just four steps. Ensuring that we have energetic and enthusiastic persons convening in a common space, 
to connect ideas. So how we convene, how the conversations unfold are all really important to, to foster that space. We need demonstrated commitment to forging communities of learning and practice. Maybe it's the educator in me, maybe, but I do think this has merit. We really need to be learning together. We need to be proactive in having spaces like this. Creating online communities, there might be something that could be done to have people joining up in um, spaces where you can be talking about what are some of the initiatives that are underway so you don't have five proposals of the same site, same type. You could do so many things to learn what else is going on in town. Also, the application of tools to capture and change and celebrate progress is really important in our work. We can't be discouraged because it is trying and it's troubling work at times. It's slow. We make headway and we also regress. So sharing um, really practical tools um, has been proven to be an effective strategy as well. And then sharing power, roles, and responsibility for getting things done by different parties. So it's really spreading that responsibility around and sharing the load. If you're a good public speaker, you should not be the one speaking all the time. It really is necessary to prop up and support others to develop some of those skills. Yes, we have our talents, and yes, we should use those, but so should we be also cultivating qualities in our brothers and sisters so that we're enabling a culture of empowerment. Okay, last bit of chocolate, last taker for chocolate. One more quote, if I could, please, please. If you would, uh, Mike's coming. There are also moral and ethical reasons for working together. Collaboration implies a deeper, more intimate, and inclusive kind of democracy. It is a way of tying together all members of society, regardless of their social, economic, or political standing. James Butcher. Thank you so much. Please. Thank you. So no matter what areas you are working on, the collaborative approach becomes most effective when using these strategies. So we saw effective um, intersectoral collaboration, vibrant communities was a great example of that. Um, Evidence-based input and facts from the community, extreme clean, relied on input of participants, um, appropriate design and delivery uh, from uh, communities, career and connect. They had that well in hand. And aligning with larger systems and harnessing multiple benefits. We saw Opportunity Chicago really be brilliant about how it was bringing um, those results from large system changes. So we need communities of learning and practice that are leading transformational learning through our neighborhoods and communities. And successful, sustainable changes uh, require reflection and discussion. And Miles Horton of the Highlander School fame, where he, Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. did some of his training for social change, Miles Horton reminds us, we only learn from the things that we learn from. So reflection and recalibration become imperative if we are to achieve the big dreams we dream. We need boldness and open spaces to say what needs to be said and to do what needs to be done. We need you to be the game changers we need in the world. You are the game changers of London and Middlesex. And what a privilege and pleasure it is to have some brief time with you here. So the London Community Foundation has doubled the amount of money available to invest. They are calling for creative, innovative, and collaborative solutions to address one of the issues in the vital signs, as you heard earlier. So think differently. Think blue milk. Think blue questions. Especially people here who may not have considered putting in a proposal before. We urge you to create possibilities with one another. Share your ideas. And like Samuel Butler told us, speak daringly. Open up to one another unreservedly. So as I work towards the conclusion, I'm grateful for the fine stewardship of this event of uh, Laurie Runciman and Tony Kyle. And I'm also grateful for your creativity and courage as you together bring bold and daring solutions. Uh, Martha Powell, president of the, and CEO of the London Community Foundation, said it nicely. These initiatives, game changing that is, we believe that these projects will move the needle on the most pressing issues that our community is facing. 
The former Czech Republic President Václav Havel, one of my heroes who I was able to be with before he passed away, not intimately, but just, you know, I just saw him. Um, I was asked if he was an op he was asked if he was an optimist or a pessimist about the future. He said, "I am not an optimist, but I do believe that there that things will turn out well. I am not a pessimist because I know that uh, there are chances of things also going well, but possibly badly. I have hope. Hope is an important as life itself. Without hope, we will never reach our dreams." I will close with a deep reflection, a poem of sorts, a call to action, an opportunity for us to co-create for ourselves and for the planet. The earth is a living conscious being in company with peoples of many different times and places. We name these things as sacred, air, fire, water, and earth. Whether we see these as the blood, breath, body, or energy of the mother, or as the blessed gifts of a creator, or as the interconnected systems that sustain life, we know that nothing can live without them. To call these things sacred is to say they have value beyond their usefulness for human ends, that they themselves become the standards by which our acts our laws, our purposes must be judged. No one has the right to appropriate them or profit from them at the expense of others. Governments that fail to protect them forfeit their legitimacy. Yes, all people, all living things are part of earth life and so are sacred. No one of us stands higher or lower than any other. Only justice can ensure balance. Only ecological balance can sustain freedom. And it is only in freedom that the fifth sacred thing we call spirit can flourish in all its diversity. To honor the sacred is to create conditions in which nourishment, habitat, sustenance, knowledge, beauty can thrive. To honor the sacred is to make love possible. To this, we all dedicate our curiosity, our will, our courage, our silences, and our voices. To this, we dedicate our lives. Thank you all for your participation, your good energy, your vitality. Game changers of London and Middlesex, go get them. Thank you.